Hello and welcome to the Desktop Developer live stream where every week we talk about how desktop developers create applications, how to think about new technologies, how to build user interfaces, cool graphics tools. And today, like every week, I'm joined by my co-host, Billy Hollis. Hello, Billy. Hey, Walt, how are things this week? It's a beautiful day in Tennessee. It is nice up here in Seattle. I think we outnumber you. Both Greg and I are in Seattle. Yeah. Yeah, and today our guest is Greg Hurlman. Hello, welcome to the show. Hi, Juan. Hi, Billy. How are we all doing today? Good, good. 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 So, so you have an interesting title or an interesting job. You are part of the Power Platform team. I am. I am. And then you work on a subset of that, which is the uh, in Power Apps, correct? I do. I'm a developer on the Power Apps component framework team. So Power Apps, for those who don't know, is uh, is a cloud platform that lets you create applications that'll run on your desktop OS, on on your tablet or on your phone, and it is a drag and drop, low code or no code um, application platform for app makers that aren't necessarily developers, though they can be, to create these applications quickly and uh, get running. And my part of the uh, product team, we work on the Power Apps component framework. So if you want to create custom UI controls or components for these Power Apps, you use our framework to do that. And that's a total modern dev uh, experience with TypeScript or JavaScript, HTML, and CSS. You know, I think about one of the changes in the last couple of years on the internet is that we got a lot more data than we used to have from sure all over the place. Because companies have their own and you can get it from all over the So is one of the reasons why you'd want to create these components to do old, maybe better, or custom data visualization of some kind, because that doesn't do much good to people if they can't consume it easily. They do, absolutely. One of the one of the main uh, uses for the component framework that we've seen from our community since we've been out uh, and available for the last uh, nine months or so is a lot of data visualization work, whether it's uh, drawing a map instead of a list of account addresses or uh, things like um, validating a credit card in, uh, information that's being passed in or uh, formatting phone numbers or formatting any any sort of data uh, and graphs and charts and 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 so on. It's a it's a big use case. Um, and the platform gives you the data, and then you just write write the uh, code to actually show it. Now you don't always need the component framework. A lot of that uh, data UI stuff you can do inside Power Apps itself using the Power Apps scripting language we have. Um, that is not much more complex than what you might put inside a, an Excel formula bar uh, to format some data. Let's let's drill down on that for a minute. Mm -hmm. So, so um, out of the box, if I'm creating a Power App, um, I it's basically the what my, why I typically use it is there's a drag and drop form. I can put controls. That's what I would call them. You call them components, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, if I can drag the controls over there, I can then bind them to some sort of data source. Uh, and the low code approach is that a lot of this can be done without me ha without anybody having to write JavaScript or any other language, right? It's more like you said, an Excel formula. But what you're saying is, so uh, um, Power App ships with a lot of controls, mm -hmm. but you're part building the parts that let other developers create custom controls or custom components. Is that correct? That is absolutely correct. So the custom components that you create as a developer, um, once they're deployed to uh, deployed to the cloud, deployed to your Power Apps environment, will show up right next to all the other out of the box controls, so that app makers can just drag and drop them into their application to build whatever it is they're trying to build. Now, chances are, if you're, you're initially going and creating these controls, you're probably creating them for a particular task. If you've got a, a business need and you're creating a Power App to do X, Y, Z, and they just need this extra control to get across that last uh, finish line. Um, and you just, as a developer of those, uh, those components, you just need to be flexible, don't to not design this specifically for whatever it is, uh, but may leave yourself open so that later on uh, app makers can take your component and use it in another way that maybe you didn't plan, but unlocks additional functionality that they can build on their own without having to call IT for another component. And are these available? And so a, app, a programmer can create one of these components and then they're in a store? Uh, they, they What they are is... Um, inside a Power Apps environment. So uh, Power Apps are, um, they do require a micro, Microsoft 365 tenant. You have to log in with that account. Um, and inside the Power Apps uh, platform, we have what we call different environments. So these are like little mini tenancies inside your ten uh, overall organization uh, tenancy. 
Uh, so you can split up um, deployments of, of components or data connectors or data policies uh, by environment. So you can have like a dev environment, test environment, production environment, or maybe you have a separate environment for apps that use more of the social media connectors as opposed to just the uh, corporate connectors. And you can have different data policies around that. So it's a, it's a way to uh, separate out um, your configurations for whatever your organization uh, needs overall. I see. Now I'm kind of interested in, because this is, this has been an area of, of evolution for a lot of desktop developers in the last mm -hmm. few years. If mm -hmm. they come from something like um, Windows Forms, then they're accustomed to fairly static UI. And, and you're talking about going to all kinds of devices. So in on the desktop world, when we got XAML, we got all this wonderful responsive layout so that, um, so that we could adapt all these different devices. But it turned mm -hmm. out we had to do a fair amount of work to figure out how to make that happen. Sure. What, what's sort of the story for responsive layout that responds well to the devices in the, in the Power Apps world? So right now in this moment, uh, when you're dealing with a canvas-based Power App, this is a Power App where you're controlling the in, entire screen. And you might think of, then somebody thinks of a Power App, they can think of a canvas-based Power App. We don't have um, an easily, um, an easy responsive answer right now. You, you can uh, configure all the controls to be uh, to be responsive where all the X and Y coordinates and the height and width and, um, are all programmatic as opposed to just a, just a number or just a spot. Um, but it is a whole lot of work right now, a lot like it is with, with uh, XAML. Um, we are working on um, enhancements to that. We are working on um, enabling makers to have an easier responsive um, solution inside their Power Apps. Uh, most makers right now will create a, a desktop power app um, and then also a phone power app separate uh, just to yeah. make things easier for them right now. That's what I was going to ask. And of course, that's not that's not uncommon in the XAML world either. So. Sure, sure. But we are working on it and we're hoping to have answers for that soon. So you implied when you said there's the Canvas app, there's a, another type of app you can build with Power Apps? There is. We call them uh, model-driven Power Apps. And those are Power Apps that are based on uh, data that's living inside the common data service for your environment. And that's an app where it is form-based. Um, you don't control the UI completely, but you do control the different forms that are pulling data from your, your common data entities. So you can um, allow allow uh, users access just some of that data through a particular app you give them access to or all the data depending um, both um, the common data service and model driven apps were taken uh, from uh, the dynamics 365 product um, they were separated out from dynamics 365 and maybe made into their own layers kind of laying underneath it to where right now dynamics 365 is essentially a super customized um, version of a model driven power app. That's a great way of explaining that because that was confusing to me when I first looked at uh, uh, the power platform a year or two ago. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And and the whole common, the common data service, I think you said, right? Mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. that that was something that came from the, the dynamics world. So basically somebody creates the entities for the company and then what you create the entities, you can basically do forms over data without you yep. having to program the user interface. Is that correct? Exactly right. And you don't need to program um, your validation or you don't need to program uh, uh, lookups between entities and things like that. Um, it's just in the configuration of the entities themselves. And then the forms will just pick that up and run with it. So you get you get a lot of that security out of the box. You get a lot of that. Um, you get all the UI out of the box is really the point. And you can just focus on your data and, and, and getting things done. Now, I, now I'm a big advocate of, of low code approaches like mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. I have been for a long time. I was one of the people that that uh, kind of motivated Microsoft to take a, a, a trial with Light Switch, sure. and, I, and I consulted with that team a lot because I do believe in that approach. Uh, but one of the things that came out of that, I remember the day that Light Switch was introduced, and I captured some of the twitters that came. The tw I still have screen caps of people saying mm -hmm. things like Microsoft, don't insult my career by putting out a simple tool like this. D do you run into that with Power Apps? Do you run into some of that some of that professional developer pushback going, this isn't a serious tool for development? 
Oh, sure. Um, if there is a place anywhere in the world to create an application, there is a developer that hates it and thinks it's terrible. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I mean, there are folks there, but I, I'll, I'll tell you, I, I feel pretty good about it because uh, it was actually last year at Microsoft Build around this time. It felt like the Power Apps story really hit that crescendo where it was starting to become more than just something that that um, citizen developers or app makers are creating uh, small applications with. And I started talking to customers that were um, running their their energy companies on this, that we inside Microsoft, we we run our sales organization on on some some power apps. Um, and there's there's definitely as as time has gone on, more and more Fortune 500 companies, more and more large organiz organizations are finding Power Apps to be useful not to replace applications necessarily that they've been having, but to augment them, to give them their mobile story on top of the data that is sitting on a SQL server somewhere, or to give them um, applications that are just a subset of their giant legacy app that maybe is purpose built for your sales org or purpose built for the support, the support guys or something where they don't need where they only use 10% of the giant application, but this this uh, uh, power app enables them to create an app that is purpose built for them, that is easier to use, makes them less frustrated using it, makes them more productive, and so on. So that's the, the kind of the departmental level thing where uh -huh. you know you go to the staff to develop applications and they go, yeah, we can get that for you in about eighteen months. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And the department says, oh, I can't wait that long. And they so they just kind of take take control of the situation themselves. That that your tool can, is is a, is a good choice for them to do that if they have that kind of infrastructure already, especially. Yeah, yeah, and and you can create applications that are that are power powerful uh, very quickly. Um, they can be something that's meant to last as part of a as a business uh, process, or they can be purpose built for a particular event. Um, this past year at Ignite. Um, I actually wrote a power app for some of the staff working at Ignite um, inside the Development Architecture Center. We had a bunch of uh, cloud developer advocates. We had a lot of folks from the developer division working at in the Architecture Center, and we wanted to enable ourselves to know when so and so was working at a particular time. So if so, so if an attendee came up and said they were looking for somebody from um, uh, augmented reality or somebody who had worked on a lot of AI stuff and maybe uh, we didn't have anybody then, I created a power app for the staff to look up, okay, we have everybody scheduled, let's look up AI, okay, um, so-and-so is going to be working you know, at 2 o'clock today, why don't you come back at 2 o'clock and um, we could help out folks that way. I had a different power app that was running on all the TVs in the area that was just showing who is around now, what's going on now, what's going on and a little bit later. And it was only for that event. It was used for a week, and then we were done with it. But I was able to create those apps on top of um, just Excel data that was sitting in OneDrive in the span of just a couple days, and it provided a lot of value for that week. Yeah, that's great. And I know um, I, I'm an advocate of Power Apps, and I, I've done some conference talks on it. And one of the one of the ways I open the talk is I uh, talk about what what's the most popular database out there. You know, and I it's a room full of developers, so I typically answers like Oracle, SQL Server, and whatever. Sure, sure. And then the next slide is is it's Excel. Excel. Yeah. <laughs> Excel is really there's billions of Excel spreadsheets out there. Mm -hmm. And your point right here is it's and in the point of Power Apps is that you're you, we have these domain experts, or as Billy said, you know, organ um, people working in you know sub organizations in the company. Departments, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. departments. That's what I meant. And they they have access to the big corporate databases, but they also got all this data sitting in spreadsheets that they've customized over months or years. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that uh, it makes it really super easy to create a, it's really super easy in Power Apps is to say, here's this table inside of the Excel spreadsheet. I want to use that as my data source. Yep, absolutely, absolutely. So we have two different connectors to that. Uh, Power Apps, just, just to, uh, as an aside, has over 300 different connectors out of the box for data for all the Microsoft stuff, all the Azure stuff, all the Office uh, connected stuff, um, but also for uh, Oracle, for Salesforce, for um, all the different cloud services that are out there already. If, if there's data on the internet, chances are there's a built-in connector for it. But as you might imagine, the Office integrated uh, connections are really super powerful within Power Apps. Excel in particular has two different ways to connect the data. You can connect directly to an Excel data and bake it into your Power App for things that are static data that's not going to change. It actually gets pulled out of Excel and just baked into 
uh, the app itself. And then we have our OneDrive connector where you've got an Excel file that is live that changes all the time, but is sending in OneDrive somewhere where we connect that to that Excel sheet inside OneDrive. And that basically acts like a live data source, like a, like a database as far as Power Apps is concerned. It looks at all the defined tables inside that Excel sheet and then exposes them inside the Power App. So you can pull data, you can write data back inside the Power App and use that as a data source if that is truly where it lives. Is that where it should live? Maybe, maybe not, but at least it's on OneDrive. It's accessible to folks um, in the environment as a whole and not just sitting as a file on your desktop somewhere. Right. What do you see as the balance between um, uh, that, the scenario you just described where there's mm -hmm. a read-write sort of thing versus uh, just basically consumption that you're just exposing the information to somebody? I mean, you can obviously handle both. What kind mm -hmm. of balance do you see in the people that are using the, the tool? You know, I don't have, I don't have um, a lot of visibility into those numbers in, in general. I just have my, my feeling of it. And it seems like by and large, you see the same sort of use patterns in these applications as you might see in, in normally developed applications that we've been creating for the last uh, however long, where the, there's, you're going to have some users that are very write heavy. You're going to have some users that are a balance of read and write, and some users that are, about, that are mostly read heavy in, in the same application, just depending on their role. Um, and so it's just a matter of app to app um, in organization to organization, department to department, the apps that they're creating and what they're creating them for, um, no different than than uh, a classically created application. So I think, do you have an example you can show so we can see what a Power Apps looks like? Sure, yeah, I can um, share out my screen here. Okay, it's up on the, it's visible. All right, so this is an app that I've created. I um, created this uh, this against the Marvel API, the comic book folks. Um, I created a custom data connector to get that data, and I've got a, a little bit of custom UI in here, but if I just search for all the spider people in the Marvel world, we'll go out and, and get that and pull that back. Spider-Ham is always one of my favorites. We can dig in and, and see everything that he's done and maybe even look at Spider-Ham number one here to get a better look at that. Uh, comic. Now this application, once I had the connector created, only took me about 20 minutes to put together. And there's a couple different uh, pieces in here that I want to show you. This barcode down here is a good example of a, a data that has a visualization to it that the database doesn't have. Now from the Marvel API, I just get this number. Uh, this barcode was created from a Power Apps component framework component that I deployed to this application uh, based on top of the JS barcode library that's out there in the uh, uh, larger kind of JavaScript community. So I just needed to leverage that library to create the component. And this is actually running inside the editor itself. The, um, so, so let me break in here. So you yeah. are you are uh, building this application in a browser, correct? Yes, this is inside a, a web browser. Yeah, is and there any separate desktop tool that you can install for this? Um, there is a, a Power Apps for Windows like app in the store um, that you can that you can also use to create applications. But by and large, the the editing experience is going to be in your web browser, um, and then the uh, running experience is going to be either on in the browser inside um, a, a native store app on your OS or um, on your tablet or phone. Uh, okay, so yeah, so you're editing it right now, and you're also mm -hmm. saying that you can preview it while you're editing it, or you're building the application, you can edit it in the, or, sorry, view it in the browser. Yep, um, and you can, we do have a couple advanced tools here. I'll open up the monitor on the side so we can see. Uh, the Power Apps monitor is almost like Fiddler built into Power Apps. So if I come back here, if I'll rerun the app again, just to step back, if I search for uh, the various captains, there's a few of those in, in the Marvel land as well. Um, and look at the monitor, we can see that I, I clicked on uh, going uh, the back button a few times, and then I made a network request um, for all the nice. caps and, and then the response uh, that comes back with all that data from, from the API. Uh, so this is, this is helpful in troubleshooting when you're creating an application. Um, but one other thing that I wanna point out when you're writing the application, if you really want, um, if you hi highlight the app itself, we have this instrumentation key that is for um, Azure Application Insights. You plug that key in here, and it'll write everything your your users are doing out to uh, App Insights, and you can create uh, custom traces and so on as well. 
Um, but all of this is very straightforward. So if this, this is a gallery, this kind of repeater section here is what we call a gallery. And then inside the, the, uh, the template here, I have this item.name um, and then a little bit of a function here to get um, get my logic for if the comics are found. So if I, I show the data, if it's more than zero, if I don't, then, then I just say no, um, just to make sure that, uh, so no comics found versus a number instead of saying zero comics found. So it's, it's common or it's code like this is basically what power apps code looks like. Like I said, just like a, uh, an Excel bar, you can, um, this might look a little more, uh, familiar if you're looking at Excel, but we have this formatting capability in here because sometimes these do get uh, a little a little longer that's a but nice the, addition being able to see it in a, a not on a single line yeah yeah that is, that is nice and no semicolons no semicolons yeah as, no an, semicolons. as an OGB guy i think that's that's excellent and what i'll say is there's no semicolons because there's really technically just one line of code here it's just uh functions inside yeah. functions um if you have if you are doing more than one thing phil is not a good example let's look at the button so in this, in this case, I'm calling the clear collect function to actually look at the button. But if I wanted to do anything else, if I wanted to have another line of code to uh, maybe uh, create a new collection that um, it's, it, that gives us an error because it isn't one line, it is actually two lines. So we have to put a semicolon in here. So semicolons are optional really on the last line of code. Um, but if you have more than one line of code inside a, what we call a behavior function or an event, um, you do have to put the semicolons in there. Is that so new the, or has that always been there? That, I'm not sure when that's been there. I think that's been in there. It's been in there for a while. Um, but yeah, the semicolons let you do more than one line of code. If you only have one line of code, you don't have to bother with it. And this one thing I want to point out is this is how you're creating your 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 variables, or in this case, this is a collection, which is a, a variable as as table basically. Um, you create them. You don't have to instantiate them. You don't create them somewhere else and then use them. You just use them. So I created the collection called demo right here, and then passed in uh, this particular object, uh, this unstructured object that is passed that I created. So if I look at my collections in my application, we can see we have our demo collection that has a, a stuff function, but that doesn't doesn't actually have anything yet because I haven't run this function. So if I, I'm just, and, and if I hold down the alt key in the editor, I'm gonna hold that down. It just turns this into a running version of the app. So I can just hit go, that'll do its thing. And now if we look back at our collection, we do see demo has that ASDF. So that, that line of code actually ran in there. So, so you're you, creating data you're basically creating a collection of data on the fly. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, like we said, you could use data that's in any of these data connectors or in Excel, but also if you just need like a, 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 list, collection. a list for a drop down or something like that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So that this is like the characters thing. This is our data that we captured coming back from the API. So you, you can see it's got uh, collections inside collections inside collection because that's just the, na the nature of the data itself. Um, but that is the line of code for that for a maker. You know, you, you're using the term maker. Here. Yeah, you're using the term maker here. Um, I maker think or citizen uh, citizen developer, somebody who's writing re developing these applications, versus um, a a what we call a pro developer who is writing applications using uh, classic uh, languages inside Visual Studio or something like that. If I write, if I wanted to write my own custom component, what? Um, tools, uh, what language, and is it HTML and CSS and JavaScript or something else? It is. If you're using a custom, if you want to create a custom UI component, it is uh, based on modern uh, web development. So we give you a library that actually is kind of the shim between the platform and your code uh, called the Power Apps Component Framework. Um, and you use a, a command line uh, tool to actually uh, scaffold out your code. And then you use uh, npm to, to pack it to build your code. We have a local debugger uh, to actually test that code, um, and I can show you that real quick if you want. Uh, but it it. I was gonna say sure. To, okay, so let's see. Let me get uh, VS Code over here. So what I've I've got 
Um, okay, let me get your screen up here. Sure. There we go. Yeah, so this is a Visual Studio code. And what I'm looking at is the initial React barcode code that I got from GitHub. Somebody had created that barcode component we were looking looking at earlier in the app. It's a pretty standard, very straightforward uh, React app uh, component. And inside the Power Apps component framework, I did a couple things. I, I filled, this is um, our framework. We have a, a few different functions. We have the init function, which is the first thing that runs. Um, we have update view that runs every time we feel like you need to update your view, whether the uh, size of the control has changed, maybe the underlying data has changed, we'll call this function. And then we have get outputs if you have something you want to save, and then destroy is the last thing uh, called before we unload your control. But that that React barcode, I just moved over to this TSX file that is still just, just a React component. Uh, the only difference is really is to make this happy with, with uh, TypeScript and, and packaged it. And nice. so, so the application itself is just code. And if I run, let me just pop open a terminal here and run the local debugger so we can see what this looks like. So if I just run npm start watch, it will pop open, um, uh, it'll, it'll build it and then pop open a, a localhost website so that we can start debugging our, our application uh, live right here inside uh, the web browser. So we've got hello world, it's acting uh, just like it would inside an application and we just pop open the dev tools, which is popped open in another window, let me drag it over here. And if we look inside here and find the application, we can find our code. Um, can you bump your font a, a little bit on that? Oh yeah, I sure can. Let's see. There you go. Oh, maybe there. Close that out. So this is that same update view. Now this is compiled from TypeScript, so it looks and looks a little bit different. Um, but if we set that breakpoint and switch back to the other window and say instead of hello, we're going to say oh, it's got a little space in the end. We'll get rid of that space, and immediately we run that update view because our underlying data changed gives us a chance to actually debug. And now we're inside the dev tools like you would any other uh, web application to actually debug your application, make sure um, everything you're getting is what you think it is. Context is coming in. That, that gives you a lot of um, availability to uh, the underlying platform code, whether it's uh, utility functions, navigation functions, the mode of the application, whether you're running in web or phone and so on. Um, Very cool. Stuff about the device. It's all, there's a lot of information there. It's one of the interesting. I like. It's interesting to see how you how the team thinks about uh, testing components because that's one always the issue, right, Billy? When you create your own custom component, you're writing it in some sort of editor, and then you need to put. Then in the case of WPF or UWP, you write the control, and then you have you put put it on a page, and then you test it there. It's interesting to see how. Uh, you've done a what, basically a test harness page you got to make. Yeah, and right? that's that's actually what we call it. We call it our debug harness. Um, and the, one of the important bits I don't think I've mentioned yet about this is that the the Power Apps component framework is the very the very same framework that we use to create controls for Dynamics and now uh, now Power Apps inside for the product itself. So um, the library mm -hmm. that we that third parties are using to create their components is the library we're using to build the product itself. So we're using these same tools. We're using these same de debug uh, components to build Power Apps, to build Dynamics. And so if there's pain in there, if there are things that are slowing developers down, um, we feel it and we try to fix it um, because it's going to affect us as well. Um, we're, we've leaned way into this kind of first party is the same as third party uh, experience. And it, it helps us. It helps, it helps everybody out there. And it keeps us all on the same page, which is great. Now, let's, one of the things that that often comes up with low code kind of platforms is you reach a certain point where the complexity of the app is it, it kind of it becomes difficult to kind of balance all the views and navigate between them and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. what's the what's the approach for power apps of that sort of how high do you go before you get there? What do you what's your escape hatch when you start to get apps that are that are really quite complex? Um, there's a few different uh, bits of guidance that we've given. We have seen um, applications uh, that folks have created that get pretty complex. Uh, the applications that I mentioned earlier that our sales team are using um, are extremely complex at times with a lot of the, the rules that are in there and, and, and logic that goes on and back and forth to a number of internal systems. 
Um, and it is, it's a balancing act. Um, the Power Apps product itself is really only a few years old and we are uh, iterating and growing the, uh, growing the application and what that process looks like all the time. Um, and what we, we have that backstage area, like when I went to look at the collections and stuff like that is something that we are iterating on uh, constantly. We're gathering feedback and to, to make that easier, to make it um, easier to track when things are created, uh, which, which functions are talking to your variables, uh, which functions are talking to this particular collection. So you can track down this variable is different. It shouldn't be that who is making that change. You can track down where that is in your code. Um, so we're constantly, iterating on what that experience is as, as um, folks have really picked this up and started to build uh, really complex applications on top of it, it's, it's, ex it's exposing where those weaknesses are and we are um, making changes all the time to meet that and uh, get to that next level. Yeah, I really like the telemetry based approach. We, we do that with a lot of, when we build that outer shell for a lot of desktop applications, we put a fair amount of telemetry in it. Mm -hmm. We pretty much have to build all that ourselves. Yeah. You know, it does help in the in the development diagnosis of things. It helps to go back when some when the user calls up and says, I don't know what I did to make to make this blow up that we can go back and find out. Yep, absolutely. And that that is that's a good example of that iteration. I think the uh, the Azure App Insights bit is only a few months old at this point. Um, but it automatically unlocks a lot of that information that if you push out a change and maybe it's not crashing, but people are only using it half as much as they used to. And it turns out because you made something 10 times harder to use or you know, you've been lost yeah, trying yeah. to find it or whatever, um, that telemetry can be super useful for sure. And I think the other, other point to bring up is uh, if this grows beyond a department level application uh, and, and professional developers start getting involved in it, uh, first of all, the infrastructure is based in uh, uh, dynamics in Azure, right? And I mean, at the end of the day, um, everything is probably is sitting inside uh, some sort of data store in Azure. And, um, but uh, the common data service, if you're storing data inside the common data service, that that data um, is available to makers through the, the Power Apps Maker portal in a more accessible way. Um, but that that it, there is a full uh, web API to the common data service to build full applications on. Um, and just released into preview uh, with just after the uh, business application summit that we had a week ago is um, T SQL compatibility on the common data service. So you can open up, you know, it can open up uh, SQL Server Management Studio and query the common data service using SQL syntax. Ah, yeah. um, and if you're in Power BI, you can pull out common data service data with that SQL syntax. If you wanted, if you have a lot of complex uh, data formatting or data uh, munging you need to do in SQL before you try to show it in a chart, um, that opens up that possibility as well. That's that's brand new um, and in preview. Um, so there might be some hiccups there here and there. It is only uh, for read only right now uh, for the SQL connector. Um, but that is there as yet another way for, to get that data out um, if you're trying to build uh, full code, uh, pro code applications on top of that data. Nice. I have a since you build, since you're on the components team, I have mm -hmm. an example of some usability errors I see uh, a lot, especially on websites. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm thinking uh, um, that this would be a classic uh, problem you could solve with a UI control. So you, I was thought I might show that to you and get your take on it. Sure. It's kind of a rant that, uh, uh, I, oops, let's see, I did the, uh, let's see, that's the right thing. So. It, um, so here's where, when you show data to users uh, or ask the users to input information, a lot of websites end up with data like this. So if mm -hmm. I asked you, Billy or Greg, to look through this and find all the uh, number 49s in there, how long would it take you to find them? Several too long, and I'd probably yeah, miss one. Yeah. yeah, yeah, you get frustrated, right? Uh, and we've learned centuries ago that humans can only parse so many numbers in a row before they, they get uh, fatigue. They can't, uh, they can't really ana analyze it. So if we were to look at the data like this instead, put hyphens or periods or spaces or underscores or whatever, uh, it's a lot easier to read. Now it's a lot easier to find the 49 in there, mm -hmm. I think, right? Um, and so th what the rant for me is, 
as programmers, it's it's a minor task for us to write a regex or some sort of code that would, um, if the user enters a hyphen, we can strip that out and then store the the big number in our database. So to me, it seems like this would be a perfect example of creating some sort of user control that uh, would allow the users to type in the spaces or hyphens or whatever, and then we would just strip it out in the back end. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, that is a pretty, a pretty common thing uh, for, for folks to create uh, either data masks or data visualizations for data uh, using the Power Apps Component Framework. We've seen a lot of folks that have created like um, uh, credit card validators or credit card um, text boxes for lack of a better term, where they're putting in the dashes, but the user doesn't have to put those in. They just put in the numbers, it'll put the dashes for them or read it back or any no um, phone numbers or uh, email addresses or any, any other sort of data that is easy to look at if it's been formatted right, but if it's all squished together without any of that, any of that uh, punctuation, it, it's really hard, even a phone right. number. If you look at nine numbers in a row, it it, it, it you don't rec recognize it as a phone number even necessarily. Um, probably because phone numbers have ten numbers, uh, nine. I don't know, whatever it is. That's the point. <laughs> right? on the country. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, so there is a lot out there um, that that uh, folks have in the community have created uh, uh, components for. Uh, one thing I do want to point out, if you're looking thinking about what do you use these components for, what people have created, there's actually a great website out there. Yeah, it's not just a good URL. It's a fantastic resource called PCF.gallery. Um, and that's being run by Runner MVPs where folks have uploaded um, hundreds of different components they've built on top of the Power Apps component framework. And most of those have screenshots, or just about all of them have screenshots. Most of those have blog posts and lots of them have GitHub repos uh, also. So you can go out there, pull down their code um, and See what see what's possible. See what the community has already already created. Um, we went did to. I get, did I get the banner right? PCF dot gallery. It's PCF. It's actually that's the URL. It's PCF dot like not dot the little period. Okay. Dot um, G. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But that is a, a fantastic resource to go out there. I'm looking at just the, what's on the home page now. There's an approval status. There's text splitters. There's international telephone inputs. Um, attachment views, date controls, duration pickers, uh, a security role manager, um, all sorts of stuff that folks are creating um, for for uh, Canvas apps and model-driven apps. Both. Uh, one thing I should mention is that if you create a Power Apps uh, component framework component and deploy it to the environment, um, there's no changes no changes in your code required to use those on either Canvas Power Apps or model-driven Power Apps. It can be used on either side and um, be bound to the data on either. So that the, that would imply that the uh, the model driven apps, the designer for that sort of sets things up with metadata. And one of the things you can do is pick, oh, I want this kind of component to handle this particular data field. You can. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, in that configuration, you can say for this data field, I want this component if you are on the web view. I want a different component oh. if I'm in the phone or a different component than I'm on a tablet. Um, and it can be all the same or it can be all different or you can use three different controls depending on what your need is. Yeah, well, that brings me to, I, I can't help thinking about this because I've seen so much change in the course of my own career. Sure. Um, that, that you have a pretty good strategy at this point to talk to different devices using the uh, HTML sort of uh, a base platform. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and you've got some responsive design. You, you, we've talked a little bit about the ins and outs and, and ins and outs of that. But um, then there are some situations where you want to project to other platforms and we're kind of in a whole period of transition. I look at all of these, these different development environments that are coming out like Google Flutter and I'm working to do some work with the Uno platform and there's mm -hmm. a low code mm -hmm. platform called, let me see what's the name of it, something anywhere, I forget. And, and, um, so that's, I think we're kind of feeling our way through whether or not HTML based technologies are suitable for all the different devices we're going to go to. But in some cases like, vir you know, virtual reality devices, that, that, that really is, is not as good a fit versus other platforms are looking to go, well, you know, we'll just take our app and project it in a sense to, to different platforms and we'll change things. What's your, what's your take on, on how that's evolving and how Power Apps might fit into that kind of. I think Power Apps uh, 
come, when you're talking about an evolving strategy, maybe you've got legacy applications, maybe you've got other things that you've got a power app that does a small bit, um, is best used right now, maybe in sort of an embedded strategy where you can get power apps um, into a classic application by really just using a using a web view and loading it up, pointing it to the uh, the player URL. Um, and all of that will just flow through. The only difference is that it does require that that Microsoft 365 authentication. If you've already got that and can pass that along in your web request, then you should be uh, good to go. Um, on top of that, for legacy apps, we have a few different things. Um, legacy apps talk to a database on the back end. We see a lot of folks create power apps that are based on that same uh, database on the back end that maybe you have uh, customer support folks or maybe you have sales folks or maybe you have folks that are out in the field that are doing inspections on goodness knows what, whether it's field vehicles or whether it's oil derricks or whether it's uh, power lines, whatever. Um, and using the Power App just to input their their inspection report and hit hit save or uh, synchronize if they don't have and if they don't have connectivity at that moment, Power Apps can run offline and, and sync that stuff later. Um, and it lets them just carry their phone around with them or carry their tablet around with them without having to carry the the big company laptop and try to connect to to a, a cellular cellular connection um, and mess with all that. Um, and that can talk to that same legacy backend through our uh, SQL connectors, um, whether it's Azure, Azure SQL or if there's SQL database sitting inside your corporate firewall somewhere, there are data gateways that you can install. So Power Apps out in the cloud can talk to that 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 SQL server sitting on your network. Um, that's one integration. Uh, one integration also is uh, this robotic uh, process automation we have, um, you can create what we call UI flows inside that, um, inside Power Automate, which is our, our kind of our workflow engine that allows a Power App to uh, fill in a bunch of data, hit save. When, that, when the user hits save in the Power App, it then runs one of these UI flows. And the, if the UI file has been configured, it can actually open up this legacy application, this Windows 32 application that has a bunch of tabs and a bunch of views. and um, doesn't have any network connectivity to it. It can run that application on a on a machine that's already been set up. Open up the app, plug in the data from the Power App into that Windows 32 app automatically, and save it all as part of the workflow. Um, that's out there now as part of our our robotic process automation in inside what we call UI flows. Um, it can be super powerful to catch up uh, some of the old applications that every app, every organization still has laying around, and um, keep them. Uh, keep those applications from limiting your users um, in, in getting their jobs done. That's fast. That is fascinating. And uh, I know that uh, here at LinkedIn Learning, we've got some some old legacy applications from the old lynda.com days. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And the, uh, the data is there. It's just if I want a power app, there's no built-in connector to talk to that old legacy application. But what you're saying is, as a uh, someone in our company could create this uh, UI flow. Mm -hmm. And then once that's been created, that exposes the data that's in that legacy app to any other power app. Yep, absolutely, absolutely. So that that's gonna be mostly for um, reactive um, runs. So you're not gonna be able to read from that uh, UI flow necessarily. Although you could probably uh, hit, a, hit a button in your power app to call out to that load that data and then read and then return it. Um, you just need something to kick off that flow to begin with to, to pull that data back. So it's different than like a data connector in Power Apps where proactively um, you can configure it to go out and get that data from uh, whatever data store. Uh, so it's a little bit different in that it's not a data store, but it is something um, you can get data back from that workflow if you run the workflow first. Walt, I think we're about out of time. We are so close to end. We are. So, Greg, I'd like to thank you for being on the show today. There's a, uh, I think one of the points you wanted to mention, it was important for you to mention, is that Power Apps is for any developer. It doesn't matter it what, is. whatever type of program you are, it, you'll find a use for Power Apps. Absolutely. And if you're just trying to learn about Power Apps, so search for the Power Apps community plan. That's a free plan that we have to get yourself a Power Apps instance. The main limitation being that you can't share what you create with anybody. It's mostly for learning. But if you want to poke around at it and see what it's there, it's got the full capabilities of Power App. Um, you just can't show anybody uh, outside of uh, scare sharing your screen or something. Um, yeah, that is there. And if anyone wants to reach out, talk Power Apps with me, I'm there on Twitter at, at 98 Codes. 
And then you definitely want to pull, tune in next week to the Microsoft Build Conference. There's a lot of good information for all, all developers, whether it's at, app makers, whether it's professional developers around Power Apps um, throughout the conference. You definitely want to check that out. That's going to be great. And, uh, and Billy and I are doing our show next week right in the middle of Build. So, And we're talking next week. Fun. We're going to be, yeah, it's going to be interesting because there's a lot of sessions I want to go to. And then we're next week, we are talking to the CEO of Inventive about Uno. Oh, great. Yeah, uh, Uno has been a great platform. I've, I've played around with it myself a little bit. I just haven't had a uh, need to really dig into it. Um, it seems, seems to be every year around build time. Um, I go check that out again to see how they've changed. And I'll definitely yeah. be checking that out. Yeah, Billy, you did some work with Uno, right? I have. I was at their conference last year and, and did a presentation on some of the things you could do with examples in Uno of, of XAML. And uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm if I ever get done with it, I'm working on a book about XAML in Uno that would it's a general XAML book, but I'm doing it on the Uno platform because that's kind of where the new adopters are right now. All right. Well, we'll talk to all the live viewers out there. Thanks for joining us today. If you're watching the video uh, afterwards, remember we do this every week, and there's also an archive of the uh, live cast available. Talk to you next week. All right. Thanks. Thanks.